Welcome back to the Evolving Warfighter. My name is Dr. Franklin Annis, and today I'm joined by a special guest, uh, a historian and a man that's been engaging in uh, military education uh, for quite some time, uh, Dr. Uh, Bruce Goodmanson. He has a uh, doctorate degree from Oxford, and he's taught at uh, notable institutions uh, such as the Marine Corps University, the Army War College, um, Oxford, uh, and the Royal Military Academy at Samhurst. So uh, thank you for being with me today. It's uh, quite an honor to, to have you on the channel. You know, Franklin, the honor is mine. Thanks, sir. Uh, today we are going to have a conversation uh, about uh, military education, uh, military learning education. What does it look like? What's the purpose um, of those organizations? And then how do they support learning uh, outside the classroom or encourage personal growth as well? So with that, we'll jump in and we'll, uh, I'll ask the question, like, what's the purpose of military learning and the, the organization system that goes along with that? Well, ultimately, the, the purpose is learning on the battlefield. So we know that, you know, active service uh, involves a great deal of change, requires a great deal of innovation, or at the very least, adaptation to, to new, new circumstances. And... If you have a military organization, you send it into harm's way, you want it to be adaptive and not just capable of learning, but capable of learning rapidly, which means it's learning in parallel. There's, there's, uh, I'll use a lot of examples from the First World War because I have it, I have it on the mind, if you'll, if you'll forgive me. Oh, right. will, will, will allow me. I'm, 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 I'm doing <laughs> an article uh, revisiting a book I wrote 30 years ago about innovation in the First World War. And the uh, what I'm struck by is the degree to which successful innovation happened in parallel. It happened simultaneously. It wasn't the sort of thing where a few people observed the need, they sent reports up, uh, up the chain of command, some genius at, at GHQ or some, some central organization figures things out gives these lessons to a literary genius who who puts them into a manual that then gets 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 passed gets sent down the chain of command uh, that takes too long now i mean it sometimes happens you know and 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 there's some some very good books about that process out there which i recommend i recommend, I recommend the the works of, of bob foley uh at, at king's college uh, writes a lot about these things in the, in the german context but there's something else that's going on, and that is is this parallel, simultaneous uh, adaptation that's happening throughout the organization. So, for example, if you look at early in in uh, World War uh, One, uh, the use of hand grenades. Small number of units, particularly combat engineer units, have hand grenades. Uh, they they use them they use them a lot early on. They use them up very quickly. People want more of them, and there are all sorts of people improvising the the hand grenades all over the place. Now, sometimes they blow themselves up while while doing it, but but largely they're they're people who are using you know technology from the 1890s, so you know 20 year old technology uh, to make themselves uh, hand grenades. Now, once you start getting factory-produced hand grenades, they're a little more reliable, a little safer to use for the, the person throwing them. But the point is, this happens all at once. Uh, you see the same thing with, with trench raiding. Uh, the, uh, there's uh, commanders all along the front side. They need to find out what's going on, on the other side of no man's land. And they work out techniques for for doing that. And a lot of people are, and it's interesting that a lot of people are going back to the records of the Russo-Japanese War, okay, and drawing some some lessons from articles they 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 had read uh, read from there. A lot of our British units, Indian units in particular, Indian Army units are are drawing upon their experience on the Northwest Frontier. The raiding, you know, the a, a trench raid being a a border raid. On a, on a smaller scale, uh, the there's all, all this stuff is going on, and and again, it's it's happening at the same time. There, there, no one's waiting, or some people are waiting, but but the people who are innovating are not saying, let's 
figure this out, let's systematize it, let's turn it into, into doctrine. Yes. Well, one of the interesting things that, example I always have is like, especially the invasion of Normandy, where you have the concept of putting essentially what's a pitchfork in front of a tank to tear up hedgerows, you know, it was a simple idea that came from a farm boy. So you never have a predictor of where in the military spectrum that that idea is going to come from. Yes, right, right, yeah, yes, right, right, right. The hedge, hedgerow cutter is an excellent example from from the uh, the Second World War, and because this this was a real problem and a problem that the senior leadership did not predict, despite the fact that there were you know two full years of preparation for for the Normandy invasion, and that this was only you know a, a few dozen miles off the coast of the base. In, in a place that was well known where many people had gone for vacation, uh, that d- despite that, no, n- nobody in the system had predicted this. And yet, right, there was a uh, young man of, of, of modest rank who just breaks out a blowtorch and, and, and makes this thing happen. And there, there are lots of, of less famous uh, examples of that happening uh, you know very much throughout the second world war and this is something particularly in in the u.s armed forces uh this is this is something that we used to be very very good at which is interesting like so in times when if you look at military conflict as a spectrum would you say that as we go further towards kind of total war we're more receptive of like the crazy wild ideas and then as we kind of more become a a small scale engagement military, we're more dependent on doctrine. We really want the formal answers. We're not willing to, to take as much risk from kind of taking the crazy ideas. But you, I, I would agree with that. I think, I think that there's a, a number of things are going on. One was the absence of doctrine. That in, in, in World War II, there were so many new things going on, the doctrine couldn't catch up. And manuals that were that were available, I mean, there were lots of, of pamphlets, often locally produced, and those are often very interesting. But, but the manuals that were official were uh, so clearly out of date that a lot of people didn't, did, didn't bother with them. They were also hard to find. It was very hard to get, get your hands on a manual in World War II. That's part of it. The second thing was that the the people who were interested in getting the job done and then going home as part of the, the, the total war uh, phenomenon. The other thing, and this is particularly in, in the U.S. system or the U.S. armed forces, is the number of, of people who were tinkerers, people who were already capable of learning on their own because they came from a generation which had even though they had more formal education than previous generations, still did most of their learning informally. So if you, if, if you take somebody who is uh, working with radio during World War II, chances are he made his own crystal set when he was a, a teenager. And he did that not from a, a, a pre, pre-formatted box that you bought at the, the hobby shop, he maybe got an article from Popular Mechanics or a similar magazine, uh, got a, 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 a box from the back of the grocery store, uh, and probably the only thing, you know, some, some wire from his uncle still, you know, uh, all, all sorts of just bits and bits and bobs and put it all together. Uh, we were at that time, I, I don't want to over romanticize this, but a nation of shade tree mechanics. Uh, people, people worked on their own cars. Yeah, I- I was going to say, studying kind of philosophy side of the house, kind of the, the emphasis on individualism and self-reliance, I think, was greater during that period. And that, oh, I yes, think that, yes, no, no, we, we celebrated that. We yes. celebrated uh, the Yankee ingenuity. Uh, we celebrated the who, who were the heroes, the Thomas Edison's uh, of this world, uh, the Eli Whitney's. Uh, we, we very much celebrated those. And, and Again, our celebration of them was not entirely accurate. You know, Thomas Edison, for example, uh, wasn't just a, a solitary genius working uh, in in his basement. Uh, he had an industrial organization of lots of people working for him. But the myth 
was certainly part of that, but there was a reality under the myth. The other thing we did was we we organized our own entertainment. Uh, so so the the if um, you wanted to play baseball in in 1939 in America, you had to organize the league yourself. Hmm. It was it, it was you know the, the kids' neighborhood you got together and you you you, you formed a, a game. Uh, there, there wasn't the idea. There was, you know, I think Little League had begun, but it wasn't a big thing uh, yet. It was much more, much more, much more ad hoc. And talking to uh, to older officers, I remember a conversation with a Vietnam era officer, been a junior officer in Vietnam. Uh, this was during my own service in the U.S. Marine Corps. This was the early 1980s, and he was saying that Marines nowadays. This is 1980s. This is 40 years ago. Don't know how to recreate. Hmm. Right? They 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 uh, they don't know how to organize their own fun. They they um, uh, there is a, a dependence upon some external authority to organize things for them. Well, just looking at civilian education theory, there's a ton of like the American public education systems have shifted so much that. I could definitely see that being true, especially if you look back in history where like the role of a teacher like two kids had kind of conflict, like kids were less supervised um, during their lives. So they had to go out, interact in their neighborhoods. There was kind of less fear, um, even though there was more chance that something bad would happen to the kids. But they had to figure out a way to negotiate between each other to play those games. And now... Uh, number one, we don't let children kind of go out unsupervised anymore, or there's an external authority. So it's the teacher that or helps organize things, or they have some adult kind of stopping conflicts where I can definitely see where we've lost in the last few generations or the last couple generations that, that ability to work one-on-one -on -one and have kind of direct conflict resolution on the very... The lowest level, and that's kind of a societal issue or problem, I think. Oh, very much so, and 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 there's lots of causes uh, for it. But it means that if you want to have that self-educating military that's capable of rapid learning, that has to be taught in the organization. The organization has to embrace that ideal and do those things. In many cases, not do the things that inhibit it. You know, do the things that foster this uh, this this mentality, this set of attitudes and skills, uh, but also be sure not to hamper that. Well, that's an interesting point because I think I seem to be having a, a, a kind of circular conversation that I get trapped in all the time with people, where someone would say, "Hey, I want to learn X." But I don't. I can't afford college, or can't afford the fee to go out and learn it. And it's like, well, it's on YouTube. Go learn it. And then it's a problem of, well, if I don't have the validation process, no one's going to say that or approve that I have learned this task. Where it's uh, like we've lost faith in saying, hey, Johnny doesn't have a college degree, but he has the the capabilities and he's always been a big reader and he's, you know, he's absorbed so much that he's, he has the equivalent of it, but, but now we're so much worried on validation processes, credentialing process that we won't accept anything but that piece of paper to say, okay, now you can get promoted or et cetera, et cetera. There was a commercial in the late 1960s for the college level equivalency uh, program, the CLEP tests. Uh, and the argument was that if you're self-educated, go take these tests, and then you'll get some credits, so you can go, then then go and and uh, and finish your degree. And it was about uh, the commercial was about Abraham Lincoln uh, oh, okay. applying, applying for a job. Uh, Lincoln, right? Yes, sir. Okay, you're looking for an executive position. Yeah, but uh, what about the college? Well, I've done a lot of reading and studying. Sort of on my own. On your own. Look, um, Lincoln, I know you're a smart guy. You know you're a smart guy. You ain't going nowhere without that sheepskin, fella. There you are, an intelligent human being, but no college credit to prove it. Make learning pay. Learn about CLEP, the college-level examination program. Uh, Lincoln, you got to show his license. And the punchline was... 
hey, Lincoln, you got a chauffeur's license? Uh, the, the, and, and Lincoln earlier on is protesting, uh, you know, I've done a lot of reading and study on, on my own. But we have, we have a 19th century person like Lincoln, and whatever you think of him as, as a president, I'm actually not a fan, but that's another story. Uh, he was a very well-educated man, and, and, and largely, again, self-educated, uh, master, master of, 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 of rhetoric, and uh, just, just spoke enormously uh, well and was able to adapt. He was able to... Uh, to run an industrialized war in the middle of the 19th century, uh, largely from his 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 office, his his, his home office in the, in the White House, it's, it really is remarkable. Uh, and the um, uh, but nowadays, I mean, he couldn't um, he couldn't teach high school. You know, if if if, if um, uh, so. Um, Yes, th th these things have changed. Now, the other thing that's changing also, however, is that in, in many realms, and you mentioned YouTube, but particularly in the, in the high-tech uh, realm, the, the IT realm, the information technology realm, things are moving so quickly, formal learning cannot take place because it, 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 it's, it's too slow. If, if, you take a, if, if you took a computer science class five years ago, much of what you learned was obsolete. I mean, yes, you understand some of the basic principles, but in terms of actual techniques, that world happens, that changes so so rapidly, the people who are working in it have to keep teaching themselves, learning from each other, learning from their experience, conducting informal uh, experiments. Uh, they, they can't even wait for the manual, because by the time the manual is written, it's, it's, uh, things are... are um, are, are, are nearly obsolete. Which, isn't that like entirely parallel where we find ourselves in military education today because most of the curriculum of the kind of required professional military education is several years old. The process to change that curriculum, I know at least in the U.S. Army, takes months if not years. So when you look at saying, well, what's the purpose of military education kind of courses if they can't adapt rapidly like how are we okay we're, we're failing i would say personally so well, how do we how do we get to where we're supposed to go or how do they promote the right type of self-learning that make up for what we can't do in the curriculum well i'll, I'll tell you tell you some anecdotes and you'll, you'll forgive uh, um, uh, minor sea stories the, uh, in the early 1980s, when I was a junior officer, I went through something called the basic school. And the curriculum was based on manuals, which were based, this is the early 1980s, which were based on the static phase of the Korean War, 51, 52, 53, 1951, 52, 53. So the tactics we learned were about 30 years uh, behind the times. In particular, we were taught to defend on the forward slope. Why? Because that worked in Korea. Now, as a student of the First World War, I knew that the forward slope defense became suicidal about 1915. I mean, early 1915, spring of 1915, on, on actually on both fronts. And, the, and as someone who was trying to keep up with what was going on with, with the Cold War, but with the Soviets, I knew that the Soviets had lots of uh, artillery, uh, lots of field artillery, and they liked they, they had a preference for flat trajectory weapons, which is a function of coming from a place that's very flat, you know, that, that you know from from functioning you know on, on the steps. And so it struck me as 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 bizarre, but we were taught that the forward slope defense was the norm, and there was some you know a couple of paragraphs in the rear slope defense. Uh, but uh, that was seen as, as a, a curious thing you, you might want to do in an exceptional circumstance. And that was some of the more modern uh, instruction we got. There were many, um, I, I later was in, in the National Archives, years later, looking at the records of the staff college at Longre, 
the American Expeditionary Force in World War I established a staff college uh, the winter of 1917-1918 in the French fortress town of Langres, and the, they had French and British instructors. And I looked at some lesson plans, and I said, I know these lesson plans. These lesson plans for 1917-1918, state of the art, probably for 1916, were taught to me in 1982 with very, very few changes. That's a very, very slow pace of, of change. Yes. Yes, most definitely. And, and I'm sure you, you can multiply examples. I see, I see uh, you know, exercises which still are based on, uh, on Cold War models. The, the, the enemy is, you know, the enemy, of course, we, we want to fight, which is, which is the Soviets, only fewer of them. Um, and the, um, uh, and those are often, uh, I, I think you could probably go to Fort Leavenworth right now and, 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 um, well, not right now, they're probably closed down for the, for the, uh, the quarantine, but the, um, a few months ago and, and, and see exercises, uh, like that. There's, just this enormous, and again, I'm not averse to people studying history, but they should study history as history and place it in historical context. In fact, I'm, I'm going to argue that military history done properly is a huge part of any military education program, whether self-education or, or formal classroom education, but it's got to be presented as such in its context, as opposed to, this is the way you do it. So from my own personal experience going through PME, the, the problems I have is I do a lot, incredible amount of self-study, especially military history. But the problem, the real problem lies is we, I think, or at least the Army has a tendency to say, hey, we're teaching you this doctrine. We want you to regurgitate doctrine back to us. So we're going to give you a scenario where you have to do what we've told you how to do it. But if you have a solution to the war game that breaks all the doctrine that would fight the fight better, you're going to fail the class. Because by deviating, taking that risk, demonstrating a different way, unless you could prove and guarantee that you'd be successful, they're not going to allow you that deviates so wildly from the process. So we de-incentivize experimentation, innovation. We want people to kind of go through the exact steps and the exact formats. And um, I think that's kind of the biggest problem I see with at least my experience in, in professional military education is there's no flexibility to say, oh, this way you did it. You present it to me, I don't think works well, so I'm going to present it way back to you that I think will work better. Yes, no, and I've seen this, I've seen complaints about this going back nearly 100 years. In fact, almost exactly 100 years, starting about 1920 is when, when, I, when, when this, uh, these kind of problems with the school solutions start. Probably starts even earlier. There is, uh, there's a scene in The Great Gatsby you know, where, where the... Uh, Oh, no, no. Or is it the memoirs of the author of Great Gatsby? I forget. Anyway, but, but, but a young uh, officer at, at um, I think he's at Camp Benning, not yet Fort Benning, and uh, he's in a class, and there is a little book called Small Problems for Infantry by Captain Bjornstad, and, this was this, and it's being taught as a catechism. If then, if then. And the, the students are essentially required to recite the responses. And the, uh, this is something you see it, uh, certainly in the 20s and 30s, uh, where the veterans of the First World War uh, come back and think, oh, you know, we, in the Meuse Argonne, our biggest problem wasn't the Germans. I mean, they were in the, in the process of collapse and, and doing their their, um, what they called the, uh, their delaying resistance, the Hinhalten der Widerstand, just bas basically trying to play for time, uh, be be hoping that the winter would come and, and, and then they could negotiate their way out of the quandary. 
Uh, our biggest problem was our own logistics, organizing transport, because the French, you know, the French put us in the place where the worst roads. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I don't think this was a conspiracy that there, there's a lot of good reasons for that, including ports and railroads and all these good things. But the AEF was was there in in the in the rough country, and the biggest problems were self-generated friction. So there was this 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 idea that if if, if we can get everybody reading off the same hymn sheet, then we're gonna you know we're not gonna have problems like that. And the 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 enemy uh, became a, an afterthought. It was all about it was all about the uh, the procedures. Yeah, I've heard complaints about that where even in the like hand to hand combat, I think instruction just prior to World War II it was kind of if the enemy throws this type of punch, you're going to do this type of movement where it's to the point where if you're trying to do it in an actual fight, number one, you're not going to process fast enough. And number two, it, you know, just the, the attempt to break it down and have that type of if then scenario, you're not going to be able to recall information fast enough to use it. And, and although it, you know, sounds like a good technique, you know, trying to make it work in reality so much. No, it reminds me of an old-fashioned computer program, the kind one would write in, and I'm really showing my age here, in basic, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the, 19, the 1980s, uh, perhaps on a Commodore 64 or a TRS-80. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, you know, this is something that has been part of... A, not just our military culture, but many military cultures, that uh, we we try to systematize systematize things. We try to preserve people from having to think, and preserve people from having to adapt. And I think the roots of this, the roots of this are many. I think I think in the United States, it's a function of the industrial, the industrial age, where we had several generations of Americans who in their personal lives were doing all sorts of learning. We, we talked about the shade tree mechanics and the, the people organizing their own sports, people organizing their own music, their own entertainment, their own dances, uh, what have you. But when they went to work, they sat down at the bench and did the same thing <laughs> over and over and over again, and they weren't allowed to deviate. And that, that system, which we still have with us in things like uh, McDonald's, right? That is, is the, the, it's a very powerful model for doing certain things, but it's not a good model for, uh, for innovation and adaptation. It, 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 it breeds a, a whole lot of, of, of bad habits. Well, I remember the first time I ever got to produ or, uh, present my findings for my doctoral dissertation in front of a, kind of a wide audience of military officers. So the dissertation was all about self-development and the advantages of actually creating self-directed learners on a battlefield. And I just remember very distinctly the major general in the room saying, you would create a whole army of soldiers that would direct themselves and you wouldn't be able to control them. So I can definitely see that there's a huge fear of independent learning and we don't necessarily always see it as an advantage um, inside our structure at times oh yes no no the, 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 there is a fear of that and there's this idea that that doctrine will create harmony and i think that's not necessarily the case i think that that doctrine can be very confusing because if you tell people Things are going to be a certain way. They're going to follow this particular pattern. And when they don't happen that way, people suffer paralysis. They suffer confusion. They start grasping at straws. They start throwing the baby out with the, the bathwater. And then uh, they'll, they, they may start innovating. They may collapse. That often happens to armies when, when, when that, this kind of paralysis happens. And then when the war is over, they say, oh, well, thank God the war is over. Now let's go back to real soldiering. <laughs> and, 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 and so what's really amazing is if you look uh, at, um, and there's some, some folks, including some a very good friend of mine, down at uh, the Petersburg 
National Park, the Battlefield Park, who were looking at the tactics used, actually used in the Battle of Petersburg. And they were quite modern, very modern, but by standards of the day. And yet, when the Civil War ended... Yeah, we went back to... the Yeah, we totally didn't think about doing trench warfare after that. And... Yes, went, went right back, and then... Trench warfare gets gets reinvented and reinvented and 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 reinvented, and so, you know, I, I'm imagining a situation, military forces that don't have to go through that, that painful process of of, of reinvention, that the uh, and they don't have to break down so many preconceptions, in order to to adapt that they can say, well, in this case this worked, in this case this doesn't work, let's try this. And not have their their self concept or their discipline as an organization, their capacity to work together, their capacity for for, for harmonization, to have that be dependent upon this uh, these this very very limiting view of what the battlefield uh, should look like. If I may, let me offer an anecdote. This is a story told uh, uh, by a friend of mine, uh, Bill Lind, and Bill Lind was very much involved in the maneuver warfare movement of, of the 80s and 90s, wrote the maneuver warfare handbook, and uh, and Bill said, um, and you're saying about the Army, but this is not a, a problem peculiar to the U.S. Army, The that the U.S. Army is like an opera company that does AIDA, and they do a great AIDA. I mean, they have they, they they have the pyramids and they I mean just incredible sets, uh, palm trees. They even have an elephant, right? and everybody knows their parts to sing Aida. But there isn't much call for Aida. Mm. In fact, uh, when they're called upon to do something else, they do two things. First of all, they complain that it's not Aida. This right this this is not the real thing. The second thing is they do Aida anyway, whether or not it fits. And then when the war is over, they say, oh, okay, well, that's over. Now we can go back to practicing Aida. Which is interesting. So when I attended the uh, military history instructor course at, uh, at Fort Leavenworth, and I had a, one of the, I guess, the, the main administrator of the course during one kind of break in lecture, he said, um, essentially, like, the Romans were really good at using the Roman phalanx. You know, after going to war with Roman or Rome, fighting their phalanx, how many times do you think that they could use their phalanx the way they designed it? Because if it always worked, why would anybody fight against the Roman phalanx in that way? And the entire nature of warfare is by the time you figure out one successful technique, the enemy will never allow you to fight them like that again because they've already learned their lesson of, hey, I don't fight against this formation, so I'm going to do something different to find a weakness. And it's the question of how, and even the, the construct that we develop doctrine and have kind of set standard rules on the battlefield is kind of paradoxical to the nature of warfare because by the time you establish set techniques, and standards to use, you have one playbook that the enemy, that as soon as they come in conflict with you, well, number one, either they'll get hurt and injured and they'll learn the lesson by fight, not fight that way, or number two, they'll know it in advance and then refuse to ever set up the conditions where that technique will be successful. Indeed, here's the paradox. The, the more effective the technique is, the greater impact it will have on the enemy and the greater the chances that he will learn from it. Right. So, so there's 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 no uh, perfect technique. There's no technique that works in all in all circumstances. It's, there's an interesting reference in War One where uh, John Brown, or uh, sorry, General Pershing had access to a lot of modern technology, like the the Browning automatic rifle, the Bar. And he purposely kept that weapon system off the battlefield for a period of time because he felt that the European armies would release their innovations kind of slowly, one at a time, and it gave too much time for the enemy to adapt. So he wanted to 
essentially gather a whole bunch of innovation to use all at once and gain far more superiority that way, um, essentially changing up all of our, a lot of technology on the battlefield at one time than to introduce a bar on the battlefield, be successful in one little skirmish, have the Germans capture the gun, understand what they can do, and then by the time next skirmish that, that weapon system is no longer present that much of an advantage. Well, so, so right now I'm thinking of, of thousands of doughboys uh, cursing their show shots. Yes. <laughs> have jammed. Uh, the, um, and, and then once they realized that General Pershing was the reason they were still <laughs> using those weapons, uh, saying unkind things ab ab about General Pershing, the, I think the, the, the mistake General Pershing is making is the assumption that the innovations are few and far between and have to be centrally managed. Now, there, there are certain things like your deception program that you may want to manage centrally. I'm not saying that every, everything has its appropriate, as its appropriate level, but innovation is something that's happening all the time. And you want to develop the force train the force, educate the force in a way that fosters a whole bunch of small innovations that are happening all the time, a great deal of, of ad hoc ad hoc learning, a great deal of adaptation so that the everybody is one step ahead of the enemy, wherever that, whether that enemy be at the squad, platoon, company, army corps, field army, Army group level, and that's uh, and that's something I think that that we uh, we often forget when we're designing particularly formal programs of of military education. The, the, the idea is we we have this doctrine, we need to teach this doctrine, and once they've learned this doctrine, uh, they will at the very least have a solid basis for. A little bit of adaptation they may have to do at the uh, at the margin, and also they'll be taught to wait for the the next bit of doctrine uh, that uh, that is the officially approved response to the adaptation, which is the problem, the new problem. So it's an interesting challenge. So obviously the military is impacted by whatever col or culture it's sitting in. So we have a culture that has a really rigid understanding what education is and the structures to education and I see inside the military rightfully so we think hey we want our service member to go through the military gain some useful education that they can when they either retire or when they leave the service after four years that they have some type of degree piece of paper or certification that they can walk into a better job than what they would have straight out of high school um, but the problem I see with that is a lot of times the higher level PME, I think, is being entirely shaped or limited by the construct of what we have for whether it be a bachelor's level credit hour process or a graduate school that we keep trying to mirror the military education off of a civilian education to allow credits to transfer back and forth without asking the fundamental question of, is the civilian education construct does that even have enough adaptability to meet our needs on the battlefield? And are we like shooting ourselves in the foot, so to say, by trying to apply this kind of really outdated mode of education onto a modern military? I, yes, I, I would. I would go even further. I, I think that this the civilian construct that we have now, the extraordinary formalism of formal education both in terms of the emphasis on, on credits, on certificates, on credentials, on the one hand, and the extraordinary dependence upon the teacher that, that we're, we're in an age, and, and partially this is a function of, of, of ideology. I think our, our, um, our academic class has been more, is, is now more ideological than it has been in a very long time. But I think that I think the problem goes goes even deeper. It's the idea of what I call closed loop learning. It's it's you go to the classroom, you learn the material, you're tested on the material, 
And that whole process is independent of the outside world. So you can't say, oh, but, but I've been in the outside world. It works differently out there. You're told that doesn't matter. What matters is what I presented to you. And your success is a function of what, of how well you give it, you give it back to me. And I have one incredible example of the failure of that inside the, at least the U.S. Army. So we train combat medics to function on the battlefield. The medics that do exceptionally well on the battlefield understand the current protocol, the latest, greatest techniques to save someone's life on the battlefield. But we bring them back home and say, well, you have to be certified through the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. So you need to have one knowledge of doing this thing for the battlefield, but you need another knowledge for doing this to pass this civilian certificate that you absolutely have to have at all times. Oh, and by the way, if you want to go through the expert field medic competition to win this fancy badge to say that you are the best medic or some of the best medics in the military, there's actually a third protocol that's not as advanced as what we're doing on the battlefield because we have we can't keep up with that technique. So we have an outdated technique. So at any given time, you need to know how to do a single process by three different standards because we can't get to the point where we say, hey, we're just going to constantly learn and only have, only have you practiced and experience on what you need to do to save lives on the battlefield. So we're telling them it doesn't matter what you actually know how to do. The important thing is you have to go through these formalisms, uh, these things which you know are not as good in order to, to advance in, in our, even just to stay in, yes. in the organization. And, and so if, imagine the message that sends. Uh, it, it creates cynicism. It is hypocrisy. You're saying, don't use your mind. Put your mind aside. Put what you know aside. Don't focus on getting better at what you know is important, but get involved. Spend your time instead going through the motions, going through this, this drill, fulfilling some, some requirement that is arbitrary obsolete, and in many cases, dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Now, that, that's a horrible message to send to people. And more than that, you're crippling, you're depriving, uh, I think, the, the service people, the members of the armed forces, of one of the great benefits of serving in the armed forces, which is the ability to take on enormous responsibility at a very young age. So rather than saying, okay, you know, we're, we, we trust you with the lives of other young people, some of whom may be only a few months younger than you are. We trust you to, uh, to do emergency medical care that in the civilian world would require an MD or at least a, a, a you know, a, a nurse, right? An RN. Um, and uh, at the same time, we're not going to trust you to develop yourself, to improve this te these techniques, to learn from, from your experience, to trade these with other people. I mean, you, you may do that, but at the same time, you have to spend a whole lot of time, of which you have very little, uh, going through these, these formalities. Which is interesting. So I don't know if it's the authoritarian nature of the military in itself. But we always struggle, or at least the Army struggles, with the concept of mission command. And it's entirely built on the, the fact that I have to trust the leader below me to make a good decision or to know that when he disobeys me, hopefully he's doing that to fulfill my intent. So I ask for a certain report, and then he realizes that what I asked for wasn't really what I truly need. So he's going to provide me a better product. So he's going to change things. Um, and we should allow for that in order for mission command to work. So he's going to exploit things. He's going to change command if he sees a weakness and he can take advantage of the situation. 
But when we look at like self-directed learning, I've seen it in the Army that happened for a period of time. I see this in the new uh, Marine Corps um, manual on learning that the military wants to essentially direct or control self-directed learning. So whether it's we're going to assign an assessment matrix on top of what you're learning, or we want to be able to dictate to you the subjects that you're allowed to learn, and we're basically removing any space that we have trust, any space inside our learning environment that we can allow trust of our service members to say, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not checking on you, I'm not going to tell you the course material, but I really want you to spend some time either learning how to be a better soldier or marine or learning how to be a better person or expanding your knowledge about the human condition. And this is kind of you, you know, proving to me that you're going to make yourself a better warfighter. If we don't, if we can't trust our, our service members to even do that on a small scale, like how are we going to say, okay, in the middle of combat, now I expect, now I'm going to trust Johnny to do the right thing and practice self-initiative because I've taught him his whole entire career that he's not allowed to do anything without my approval. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was, um, I, I watched, uh, MCDB seven, the learning manual, uh, I watched it grow. I watched it be, I, I watched its assembly. I know a lot of the people who, who wrote parts of it. And, uh, I think it's a, it's a great step forward. I think, I think, and a very good yes. first step, but I agree with you. I, I don't think it goes far enough. I think that there, there is an insufficient evidence on or, or in, insufficient emphasis on a couple of things. One of them is is the freedom needed for genuine self-directed learning. And the second is is the relationship between self-directed learning and, and mission command. That if you can't trust people to teach themselves, to learn from their from their environment, from all the to learn however they can learn, how will you trust them to make decisions on the battlefield? And these, these things go together. I think life imitates school to a great extent. I mean, we, we for the more than really any people in human history, we in the, in the modern world spend more time in school spend an enormous amount of time in school. And that, I think that makes us, makes us passive. It makes us too, uh, too, not so much receptive of authority, but we wait to be told what to think, what to study, what to learn. We're always looking for that, that authority. And I think that, that really cripples us. And I think it's the, it's the job of the military educational system to break those habits. We, we can't solve the problem of civilian education. We have to, we have to enlist commission the products of that, of that system. Now, I, I think there are things we can do. I think, for example, that the old requirement that an officer have a bachelor's degree is obsolete. A bachelor's degree right now is is meaningless. The um, uh, in, in in some cases it's worse because having gone through the process increases the chances that a person is intellectually intellectually passive. It it, it actually um, uh, is something. I'll be frank. Most college education in certainly in North America these days makes people stupid. It makes them stupider yes. than they would otherwise be. And, and this isn't an anti-intellectualism. It's a condemnation of the inherent anti-intellectualism of what's happening in, in the colleges and in universities. Well, you, I would totally agree with that because number, well, there's two reasons I absolutely agree with that. It's number one is we pick, or we're the only well, allied nation I know, that will pick a recruit off the street and say, hey, I'll pay for your degree and you will become a leader in a culture that you have never experienced. And we lose a tremendous amount of money where people say, yeah, I'll be an army officer, get in and like, whatever, day 60, they're like, this is the worst thing ever, I'm only serving the bare minimum, I'm getting out. 
And uh, you see this a lot with our academy grads, with, you know, talk about, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment to have the shortest period of time of service where, you know, what happens if you took the same kid out of high school and said, I'm going to get productivity out of you as a soldier or Marine, and I'm going to slowly teach you the human the, about the human condition of what we think is important on the battlefield, but I'm going to give you a true liberal education. We're going to develop you over the course of four years, and if we think you have leadership potential, then we're going to offer you an opportunity to become a commission officer. And by that time, they can say, well, I either love the military and I love the culture, and yeah, I'd love to step up and be a leader, or they'd say, no, I'm just going to, whatever, fill my enlistment, and I'm going to leave. We'd save a ton of money. We'd have a lot better ability to pick kind of the true talent instead of, you know, offering degrees to really untested individuals, hoping that a certain number of them will be extraordinary once they walk out of college that we largely don't control. Yes, and, and many, many military forces around the world do that. Uh, you only recruit officers from among your enlisted people, people who've already made it made, made a commitment either because they had to, because it's a conscription system, national service system, or because they enlisted uh, and have demonstrated that that they um, uh, they can do well uh, in in military life, and then we say yes, then then we're going to make make the investment uh, in you, uh, give you uh, some education, give you a chance to go some someplace else for education. But usually, what what uh, I see in a lot of, of of military forces in Scandinavia, in the Baltic countries, in Israel, for example. Is that the the um, uh, the roughly equivalent the undergraduate years of officers happen even after they've served as platoon commanders as or, or the equivalent uh, you know they've, they've served for several years in command of small units they're now in their mid to late twenties and then they get a sabbatical now how the, how they handle that sabbatical uh, varies from place to place and I would I would uh, I would modernize a lot of, of uh, those 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 programs, and I do them differently. But I think the the scheduling of that is 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 a better idea. So now that we've really talked about the problem, we have time enough to try to throw out a possible solution. So what can military education, professional military education, how can they start? teaching to really foster and encourage and support self-directed learning? So the, there, there are two things. The one is that in the formal education, the formal training, the formal development, and, I, and I'm mixing those terms all up, and a lot of people have, have ways of, of slicing those. I see them as very much the same thing, that the from the start, from the first day of recruit training, we ask people to solve problems. And we ask them to solve problems to which they have no pre-formatted answer. And we do that in just about everything they do, including finding the mess hall on the first day. And I think that the uh, if we develop this culture of constant adaptation of solving these open-ended wicked problems, in, in getting everything you teach, uh, in in the rare exception where you give a lecture, uh, you get it done very very well and get it recorded. It becomes a YouTube video or the or the equivalent. But but the notion of having somebody there reading a PowerPoint to people that would be totally uh, banned. The always give people problems that require the solution to which requires that they stretch themselves. Uh, it, some many problems, many tactical problems, will require that they disobey orders in order to uh, to fulfill the commander's intent. In some cases, they'll have to disobey the intent in order to fulfill a higher mandate, such as that of ethics or or or, or morality. You constantly put them in in situations where they have to do these things, where they have to figure things out, find their own information, learn from each other. A lot of free play in the tactical realm, uh, where they have to learn from the from from their enemies, and and make 
uh, have a great deal of, of open-ended discussion, a genuinely Socratic discussion. Not, I mean, what we, we, we usually use the term Socratic method uh, to mean I'm going to uh, hold this discussion, and at the end of which you're going to come to my point of view. So you're actually saying truly encourage peer learning, not the fact that it's the teacher that has the right answer that will talk you into the solution, but it's the, here's a question, and you're going to use the knowledge of everyone in the classroom to actually solve or advance the classroom. Yes, this is the, this is the uh, Socrates as described by Xenophon, and not described by Plato, that communist, right? That authoritarian, right? So, um, uh, and if you have people who are taught this way, the first thing they'll have is a hunger for knowledge, and they'll go out and seek it, and they'll be doing a lot of reading on their own, they'll be doing a lot of discussing on their own, they'll be doing a lot of experimentation on their own and with each other. You, you want to encourage people to form study groups of various degrees of, of formality, uh, to exchange information on in, in fora, in professional journals, things like that. Uh, you, and here's the paradox, you want to give or create, I foster is a better word, I'm, I'm, I know I'm hesitating here, because uh, you're not giving some, uh, students anything or the soldiers anything, you're not giving them you're not really teaching them at much. You're giving them opportunities to obtain a liberal education that is far more liberal yes. in the genuine sense of that word than 90% of what's happening in colleges and, uni colleges and universities these days. And I, and I, I think my, my vision for this is, I know this, this sounds very idealistic, but I think the, if the armed forces do things properly, they can rescue the universities from themselves. I think, I think the, uh, uh, again, having, I've spent most of my adult life moving between universities, the world of universities and military organizations back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So I think I, I have a, uh, an unusual perspective on both of them. And for all the faults of military organ organizations that we've, we've described, they are, I find minds are far more open than, than, than they are in universities. No one in uniform ever told me that I couldn't think something. In university, people say, you can't say that. You can't think that. In the armed forces, it was, oh, you know, think what you like. No, do it this way. <laughs> There, there, there still is the, the, the authoritarian aspect uh, to it, but I found, and I, and I found teaching in military schools, I enjoyed far more academic freedom, and even freedom in terms of, of method than I have uh, in, in civilian universities. Yeah, my, if I could go down and make like one immediate change to PME, what I'd like to see, especially the officer side of the house, is to have some type of pretest walking in to say, what do you know, and actually start from where the student is, not what the book answer is. So you'll have some accelerated class, some people that will need periods of remedial training. And then you have one phase that's like, here's the doctrine that we want you to know. So we're going to briefly give you the lectures of the doctrine. We're going to run you through some big exercise, and you're going to prove to us that you understand and you can exercise the doctrine. And then for the rest of the period of time that they have, you say, okay, here's say, here's very similar scenarios or different scenarios. Everything's off the table. You can be as wild and crazy as you want. None of this is graded, but you are expected to do go through this process. You know, prove to me that you can number one draw on doctrine and adapt it. Prove to me that you can test new theories and change things to try to experiment and play with ideas. And at the end of that period, then we take kind of the best solutions out of that wargaming period and then throw it back at the doctrine designers and say, hey, this captain's career course came out with this brand new concept or idea that's worth, you know, taking a look at. So can we take a look at that and maybe change the doctrine? Because we've allowed, you know, 120 officers to use their own personal experiment, experience, exercise in a way that, you know, hey, we're going to truly let you practice your profession and actually exercise, but we're not going to punish you because you didn't hit the right 
check marks or scales that we would have done by the book answers. I would go even further, and and this is because I see doctrine, uh, I think, somewhat differently. Uh, doctrine to me, and this is the official position of the Marine Corps. And again, I'm not speaking for the Marine Corps. I'll, I should emphasize that, and we have our disclaimer at the start of this video. The um, but the Marine Corps, the official Marine Corps view of doctrine, is that doctrine is about the permanent, unchanging nature of war. It's not about particular uh, techniques or procedures. Now, if you look at the way most Marines, or at least Marine officers, use the term doctrine, they're using it in the, in, in the sense in which you use it, as in the set of, of prescribed techniques uh, and procedures and methods and, and things of that nature. So I think, uh, yes, the school should teach the doctrine, but the doctrine is about those things uh, that don't change, uh, fog and friction, uh, the need for constant adaptation, the need for constant learning, that all those, that's the, that's the real doctrine. The particular techniques, not, uh, techniques matter, procedures matter, but they are all set in particular times and places. So rather than saying, this is how you deploy a tank platoon, you say, no, in April of 1944, in this place, this tank platoon was employed this way. Did it work? Did it not? What have you? Place, the, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is we take lessons out of their context, we rarefy them, and we turn them into hard and fast rules. If in 1982, as a brand new, still covered with Cosmoline second lieutenant, I had been told in the static phase of the Korean War, we used a lot of forward slope defenses because the North Koreans and the Chinese communists had very little in the way of, of artillery. And what little they had was mortars. That's very different from being told, as a rule, you will defend on the, on the front slope. And 90% of what, even more than that, uh, in the doctrinal manuals is the calcification of lessons learned in particular times and places. But we take, we, we, we take these things, we deracinate them, we take out all the flavor and all of the local conditions that that um, that gave birth to those techniques. So I I, I would yeah go go even further rather than saying here's the doctrine, you can um, uh, you can change it according to the circumstances. I'm saying no, these things were taught in particular circumstances, or they, these things worked in particular circumstances. They may work in others. That's up to you. that's up to you. So I guess what I'm saying is not I only guess, I'm quite quite sure that what I'm saying is that you PME is history. Yes. It's inescapable. You you don't want to take the history out of the PME, right? There is there there is no goddess but Clio and Michael Howard is her prophet. That is our our, our Shahada. The uh, or my Shahada. Uh, that uh, whatever you're doing in PME, you are doing military history, but you need to do it explicitly. And to say that the reason we break up a, a squad into three fire teams is peculiar to circumstances, you know, in the Pacific in 19, 1944, and, and yes, it also worked in Korea, it also worked in Vietnam, but it may not work in the future. Now, I, I happen to be very fond of the fire team. I like the triangular squad. It's you know very very much in in my uh, in the marrow of my bones. And I've written many many um, many love songs to the three, <laughs> the three fire team squad in in various publications. But I have to all I can never forget that it is a function of particular times 
and places. If the weapons change, if the circumstances change, I have to sacrifice it on the altar of what works. So when we first were writing back and forth, you raised a really interesting question, and it was how, what's the percentage of learning that occurs in the different kind of domains of uh, military education, whether it's kind of operational on the job or institutional training, whether it's the military courses or, or required civilian education or through self-directed learning, what the Army calls self-development. I'm really interested to hear what the answer, your answer to that would be. Well, I certainly can't give you a number. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not going to give you a pie chart. And as much as I like pie charts and, and doing things in color and, and things like that, uh, I think the important thing is to have this culture of self-directed learning that every educated person I know is self-educated, regardless of whether or not he's got, he's got credentials. And we need to tell people that right away. This is, this, this is a personal journey you're going to have to put yourself out, not just make effort, but you're going to have to take charge of your own learning. Now, we're going to give you lots of opportunities to do that. And whatever we do in the formal schoolhouse, and this could be, you know, in a classroom, physical classroom, could be online, could be whatever we do that's directed from above, we're going to do it in such a way that enhances rather than retards your capacity for self-directed learning. So, for example, we're never going to tell you, oh, don't think about that, just do it. We're never going to tell you that, oh, this is just the classroom, this is the schoolhouse. In the real world, you'll do it differently. So why, why go through this, this dance? Who benefits? What's the purpose? Because the, the, you know, the, the unfortunate fellow who didn't get the word that this was just for the schoolhouse is going to get himself in trouble and worse, get other people in trouble. Uh, so so um, why do you have these, you know, th this formality? The, the formal school must build the habits for self-education. And also, and I think your point of, of adjusting the course to, to the, the level of the students should also build upon that so that we, we, we have a, a formal education system enshrined, actually enshrined um, in law now, you know, uh, with Goldwater Nichols and, and its, its, um, its follow-ons that say, you know, at this rank, you must learn this. But what about the people who've already learned that? Yes. Shouldn't they get ahead? I know of cases of people who have done the, the distance learning equivalent of a particular course, and then they get orders to that course. Hmm. And they do the course over again at great cost to their, 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 uh, their own sense of reality, uh, to their own you know, time, uh, and to the taxpayer. So why not simply say, a very easy reform uh, to implement is that if you've taken the course on your own by distance education in your own time or on your own time, when you get the, the orders to the formal school where your duty is to study full time, you get to go to the next school. Yeah. And does that mean that they'll, they'll, there, there may be a, you know, a captain, Navy lieutenant, you know, 03 at the War College, sitting there with lieutenant colonels and, and commanders. Why not? In, in the battlefield, you're not going to only learn from people in the same pay grade. You, know, you need to learn, be able to learn from your superiors, from your peers, and from your subordinates. That's an essential skill. So why are we segregating people by, uh, by rank in, in our various schools. Oh, I completely agree with that. So unfortunately we're running short on time, but uh, could you tell the audience about, well, I know you have a ton of self-directed materials out there for individuals that want to engage and I, 
I actually love your tactical decision games, but could you tell the audience where to find your material and how they can get started with some of the stuff you've made? Yes, I, I've got a website, and this is my personal website, called the Military Learning Gateway. And the, the URL, which I, I think you'll be kind enough to put under the, the video, uh, is teachusmc.blogspot.com. And again, I'll stress, even though I have USMC in, in the name, this is, this is an unofficial uh, website, uh, which reflects my personal opinions, lots of them, but my personal opinions um, uh, over neither Uncle Sam nor, uh, nor, nor the U.S. Marine Corps has uh, endorsed this. Uh, and uh, uh, it's got lots of, of, of goodies for the military learner. It's got something called Radio PME. I'm a huge fan of podcasts. I think podcasting is, is uh, one of the more powerful learning tools uh, out there. Uh, so Radio PME, uh, Radio PME, there's two branches, history and, and present, which give you links to lots of podcasts that will be of interest. Uh, but also I do decision games. And I have what I call the decision game club. And right now it's all online. Uh, in, in normal times, sometimes we do things in person. Uh, but right now we're all online. And you can find that, again, at, at the website. Okay, thank you. Well, it's it's been an honor, and I'm sure we could talk for several more hours. I'll have to try to find a time to have you back on the, the channel, sir. Franklin, I look like forward to that. Thank you very much. For the audience out there, I uh, invite you to subscribe to The Evolving Warfighter for more videos on uh, military self-development and military history. Until next time, focus on your self-development so we can dominate the modern battlefield. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Franklin. This is great fun.